In this video, you're going to learn about blood and the cells that are found within the blood and the liquid that the blood cells are suspended in. So you've known about blood all your life. If you cut your finger, you see blood. If you have any type of injury and that red ooey gooey stuff, sticky taste metallic starts coming out of your body, out of that wound, we know that's blood. We know it when we see it. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of blood and the cells that are found within, and then we'll talk about the importance of some of the structures that are found on those cells that help us to uh, know our blood type and to be able to receive blood transfusions. So here in this image you can see you have erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. Remember, erith means red. Your red blood cells are the most numerous of all the cells, and you have one white blood cell here. White blood cells are leukocytes. Luke refers to white. You'll see by the time we're done today that there are five different types of white blood cells, and each one of them are found in a different abundance, and they each have a different function. So let's begin. All right, so blood is made up of liquids and formed elements, some of which are cells. So about 55% of any volume of blood is plasma. Plasma is the sort of straw-colored liquid that our blood cells are suspended in. It's mostly made up of water. In that plasma, you have associated or you have different proteins that are floating in that. But think about what your blood does. Blood's job is to transport things throughout the body. So hormones, ions, nutrients, waste products are all in our blood. But the main components of blood are what we're going to look at in this discussion. You'll learn more about all that other stuff in your lecture class. If you're in mine, I know you're going to learn a whole lot because I love talking about blood. All right, so 55% is the plasma. So here you can see the liquid portion of the blood. Uh, these are tubes that are filled with plasma, mostly water. All right, in addition, oh, sorry about that. In addition to that, you have about 45% of the blood that is made up of the formed elements. Your formed elements include your erythrocytes, which are your red blood cells. The red blood cells job is to carry oxygen. When you breathe in, oxygen is going into your lungs. You've got blood that's going out to your lungs through your uh, cardiovascular system, right? So that blood, the blood cells are traveling in the blood vessels and it goes out to the lungs and it grabs a hold of that oxygen that you breathed in. But at the same time, it drops off that CO2, that waste product that your body created when you were making all that ATP. Oh my God, Miss Nick, you're making me think back to 2 or to my uh, anatomy one class. Yeah, well, you didn't think you could forget all that stuff, right? All right, so your erythrocytes pick up that oxygen and through your circulatory system, take all that oxygen out to body cells where it diffuses. Oh, there's that AMP1 again. Where it diffuses from where there's more oxygen to where there's less. So the oxygen moves from the erythrocytes into body tissues so that those body tissues can use that oxygen to make ATP. Now remember what we just said when we make ATP, what else? That's exactly right. We make that CO2 waste product. So the blood then is going to pick up that CO2 and carry it back so when it circulates through the lungs, we get rid of it. Wow, aren't our bodies amazing? So all that just from thinking about what erythrocytes do. Erythrocytes are red blood cells and their role is to carry oxygen. Your leukocytes are what we commonly call the white blood cells. Your white blood cells are your warriors, your fighters, your soldiers. They're there to protect your body, so they're components of your immune system. You have five different types of leukocytes, and each different type has a particular role. It fights a particular battle. It fights a particular invader. And your thrombocytes are what we commonly call platelets. Now, platelets are not cells because they're just fragments of cells. Does anyone remember what the role of the platelets is? Yeah, I know. I pause like you can really talk to me, but you can answer anyway. Platelets are responsible for blood clotting. So if you take a full blood sample and put it into a test tube, 
and then put it into a centrifuge. A centrifuge is a device that spins really, 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 really fast. And when it's spinning really fastly and you have a test tube full of a solution such as blood, then all the heaviest stuff will settle out to the bottom. So if you spin blood in a centrifuge, you'll see when you're done that all the heavy stuff is settled at the bottom. So remember your erythrocytes contain iron. So they're the heaviest and they make up about 45 or I'm sorry, a little less than 45 percent of the total volume. You have less than 1% which forms this area right here and we call that the buffy coat. So it appears sort of white when you spin it out. So the buffy coat has, is where your white blood cells and your platelets and associated proteins that are floating around all in the blood, uh, various proteins, excuse me, will be found. And then you have about 55% of that total volume is going to be made up of your plasma. Now this is in a normal blood sample. If you become dehydrated, what did you lose? Well, you didn't lose erythrocytes or leukocytes or platelets or proteins. You lost plasma. So if you are dehydrated, you have less water. So you have less water here in the plasma. So this is known as your hematocrit, right? So this is your normal hematocrit. Your erythrocytes are about 45%. If you're dehydrated, then a higher percentage of your hematocrit would be cells, not liquid, because you don't have as much liquid, so your hematocrit would go up. All right, let's get rocking. So here you see a normal blood smear, and you can see the most numerous cell type are the erythrocytes. Your erythrocytes are your red blood cells. They're very, very small cells. They are... Uh, biconcave in their shape, which basically, if you think of a biscuit that is still biscuit dough, and you take it between your fingers and you squish it and you make two little depressions on each side, that is biconcave. Your erythrocytes begin their life cycle with a nucleus. You got to have a nucleus to make proteins. You got to have proteins to make hemoglobin. You got to have hemoglobin to carry oxygen. But when those erythrocytes are mature, they eject the nucleus and just become little bags of hemoglobin. That's why they have that biconcave shape. It allows them, because they got rid of that nucleus, to have more room, more surface area to carry that oxygen. So these are all erythrocytes. Here you have a neutrophil and a lymphocyte. Those are two of your white blood cells, and you can see they appear very differently. I'm going to give you some memory tricks in a few minutes to help you be able to identify those. And then all these little purple spots that look sort of like you peppered, sprinkled some pepper in there, okay? Those are your little fragments. Those are your thrombocytes or your platelets. Platelets are responsible for blood coagulation and stopping bleeding. That process is known, known as hemostasis. Not homeostasis, but hemo. Hemo means blood. All right, so let's begin a brief look at each of these. Your erythrocytes, as I mentioned, are your red blood cells. Their job is to transport oxygen, and they do so by oxygen binding to hemoglobin. Each hemoglobin molecule can transport four molecules of oxygen. So the hemoglobin, each one, binds four oxygens, and you've got millions of hemoglobins within each of your erythrocytes. Now, let's think about uh, this whole idea of how many erythrocytes we have. So, you have four to six million erythrocytes per cubic millimeter, okay? That's one microliter. So, it's one millionth of a liter, yeah, it's really, 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 really small. So it's like it would fit on the head of a pen. You know, those stick pens like Granny uses when she's sewing something. Yeah, that's a microliter. And you have four to six million erythrocytes that will sit on the head of that pen. And each one of those has millions of hemoglobins. And those hemoglobins can all bind four oxygens. So, yep, you got a whole lot of oxygen in your body at any given time. 
All right, so here you see the picture. We said they have no nucleus in their mature form because they have ejected that nucleus after they've made themselves into great big bags of hemoglobin. So that gives them the biconcave or squishy shape. In addition to carrying oxygen, there are glycoproteins and glycolipids, all the normal things that you find embedded in cell membranes. But there's some really important glycoproteins on the membranes of your erythrocytes that are responsible for determining your blood type and the blood group that you belong to. So the presence or absence of these glycoproteins determines your particular blood group and typing, and we'll discuss that near the end of the lecture. Your thrombocytes are your platelets, so here you can see the tiny little purple spots. So this is where you've got a bunch of the thrombocytes that are still fragmenting off this big megakaryocyte. That's what they start from. So you have this great big monster cell that just breaks apart. And when it breaks apart, it becomes all these little fragments. These are your platelets. So again, they're involved in the blood clotting process. Now, there are only 150,000 to 400,000 per cubic milliliter per microliter, again, uh, in a particular blood sample. So if you have extremely low numbers of thrombocytes, it might be difficult for your blood to clot. And if your blood doesn't clot, then of course uh, you're going to lose more blood when you have an injury. So you would have low number of clotting factors if you have hemophilia, what we commonly cl call free bleeding, so you don't clot. If you have extremely high numbers of platelets, then your blood can clot when it's not supposed to, so inappropriate clotting. That can lead to large clots forming and blocking the flow of blood, so obstructing blood vessels or those clots can travel in the blood and can lead to death if they lodge in blood vessels associated with the lungs or the brain. And yes, you do need to know these, these approximate numbers. Your leukocytes are your warriors. Again, they provide your protection against infection. They destroy or try to destroy pathogens, pathogens, pathology generators. So bacteria and virus and defective cells and cancers, your leukocytes try to fight all that off. So here in this image, you can see there are several different types of cells. They all have a very different appearance. Some of them look pretty much alike. So both of these are the same type of cell, but that one looks different from that one. It looks different from that one and that one. So there are five different types, but we classify them into two major categories. We have granulocytes, which have visible cytoplasmic granules. They have lobed nuclei, which means there's more than one lobe. Well, more than one lobe, more than one lobe, more than one lobe. Visible cytoplasmic granules and the appearance of those granules and the color that they stain helps us to identify whether our granulocytes are neutrophils, eosinophils, or basophils. Notice all of these have fill, fill, fill. So remember your granulocytes are filled with granules. We'll learn how to identify each one. Your A granulocytes, remember A means without, so they have no granules, but that's not really right. They just have teeny tiny little granules that are in the cytoplasm that are too small to see with traditional microscopy. So if you look, here you've got a great big, big, big cell with a great big nucleus. Here you've got two cells with great big dark nucleus. But you don't see granules in the cytoplasm of these cells because they are very, very small. So they're called a granulocyte. They usually have a rounded or sort of kidney-shaped nucleus. So we see that, right? Okay. And these include your lymphocytes and monocytes. You have two different types of lymphocytes. You have your T cells and your B cells. And we'll talk about those more in lecture. We'll just see some examples. You really can't look at these, though, uh, in the lab and tell which is which. But I do want you to get an idea of what these look like. All right, so you see you have around 4,800 to um, 10,800. So round it up, and you've got somewhere around five to 11,000 of these cells in the same amount of blood. So you see there are many, many fewer of these cells 
than you see of our Luke of the uh, erythrocytes, right? All right. So let's look first at the neutrophils. The neutrophils are the most abundant of all of our leukocytes. So the neutrophils make up 50 to 70 percent of your leukocyte count. Here you can see two neutrophils. Your neutrophils have a very pale staining cytoplasm. So you see the dark nuclei. Here you have dark nuclei. You can see two of the lobes very clearly here. Here you see what looks like four lobes. And then on this one you see one, two, three big lobes. All of that is the nucleus. So you see usually somewhere between two to five different lobes depending on how the cell was laying when the blood smear was made. But look how pale the cytoplasm is in these, okay? So neutrophils are the most abundant. They're your bacteria slayers. They're the first responders. They come in first and try to kill all the pathogens, and then if they can't handle it, they call in the backups. So neutrophils, most abundant, 50 to 70 percent, very pale staining cytoplasmic granules. Okay, next we have... Excuse me just a minute, get my mouse working again. Next we have the eosinophils. Your eosinophils make up 2 to 4 percent of your leukocytes. And I wanted to show you two different views of this because first you see there are very visible cytoplasmic granules, but you look for the cytoplasm. Look for a very red staining cytoplasm and that typically indicates that you are looking at eosinophils. Your eosinophils eat parasitic worms. So that's their major job. They release these enzymes that they're holding in those granules and the enzymes help to digest and destroy parasites, especially parasitic worms. So your eos are your worm eaters. But their numbers also increase dramatically when you have an allergic response to something because you'll see in just a minute the basophils. The basophils are going to release histamine. Your eosinophils eat away some of that histamine to help keep your allergic responses in check. Now here we have the basophils. So this is a basophil and this is a basophil. Now this is not a basophil. This is not a basophil. But I wanted you to have that comparison. See the purple stained granules purple stained granules. So not only is the nucleus stained dark purple, but the granules are as well. Now your basophils are the least abundant of all of your leukocytes. Your basophils um, are going to increase dramatically in number during allergic responses because their primary job is to release histamine into infected tissues or uh, into tissues that are responding as part of the inflammatory response. All right, so those are the fills. We had the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Those are your granulocytes. Your, oh, sorry, your agranulocytes include your lymphocytes, which are your T cells and your B cells. Now, these are going to have very different roles. Your T cells are your warriors. They go out and fight. Your B cells are your weapons makers. They make antibodies. Now, you're going to get a whole lot of that in your immune system lecture, so I'm not going to go into a lot of differences in those. But I wanted to point out, these are your second most abundant. Okay, so you have lots of lymphocytes. You can see they have a large, round nucleus. And there's very little cytoplasm peeking out around the edge. So that's how I always tell students to identify these. So that, 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 and this one, uh-oh. All of those are lymphocytes, and those are your second most abundant. And then you have your monocytes. Your monocytes are the monsters. So these are the largest. The lymphocytes are the smallest leukocytes. Your monocytes are going to leave the tissues and once they get out into the tissues they can become wandering macrophages. Okay, so remember monocytes and lymphocytes are your agranulocytes. Your monocytes are your wandering macrophages once they leave the blood and get out into tissues and you know what a macrophage does, right? Big eater. So these are going to be phagocytic cells. 
All right, before we go into blood typing, let me give you a little bit of a run through here uh, of, and a silly little memory trick to help you remember the abundance of these cells. So I'm going to backtrack where I have them all printed on one. So you've got neutros, EOs, and basos, lymphocytes, and monocytes. So in order of abundance, do you remember which one there were the most of? Mmm, that was neutrophils, right? And which one was least abundant? That was your basophils. They're the rarest. So here's your silly memory trick. If you just use the first letter of all of these types, right? N, E, B, L, M. Never let monkeys eat bananas. Most abundant, least abundant. Let's do that again. Never let monkeys eat bananas. From most abundant to least abundant. 